You're listening to WCOM LP 103.5 FM Carborough and Chapel Hill. It's a Tuesday, it's five o'clock, and that only means one thing. It's time for another round of Snarky Faith with your host, Stuart Deloney. This is a space where we irreverently wrestle through life, culture, and spirituality, all with our heads in the clouds, our tongues in our cheeks, our hearts in our sleeves, and our feet on the ground. At Snarky Face, the questions or even the answers are never the point. It's all about the conversation. So here's your host, Stuart Deloney. Well, good afternoon and welcome to another round of Snarky Faith Radio. I'm your host, Stuart Deloney. And hey, did anyone catch the big game, the Super Bowl? It was a good game. Bad commercials, good game, and kind of a meh when it came to good old Justin Timberlake. Didn't really seem in sync with me. That's kind of how I would answer it. Or if you ask my kids, there was kind of a one thumb up, one eh, I don't care, and two kind of big thumbs down. So... Justin, because I know you love this podcast, just a little bit of constructive feedback I'm giving you here. But we're not here to talk about Super Bowl halftime shows. We're here to talk about constructive feedback in the realm of craziness in Christianity. And guess what? I know you're like, how does this happen every week? How can you have a show that continues to come back week after week to pick apart and talk through the insanity of Christianity. But we do. And it's called Snarky Faith. I uh, started this podcast. Just a reminder for those that are new and may not be aware of this podcast. Maybe just tuning in. Maybe just listening for the first time. Started this really on the grounds to kind of speak to the spiritually disenfranchised out there. Those that say, I'm sick of all this craziness. Those that say, hey, Jesus is kind of cool, but the rest of the people that seem to follow him or the rest of the people that seem to scream his name um, at other people, they're a little bit nuts, and I don't like that. So here, yes, snarky faith. The idea is to somehow extract Jesus from the Christian insanity. And do we have insanity this week? Were you worried I wasn't going to bring any back? Were you worried as I go out and search and hunt for crazy Christians that I was going to come up empty? Well, fear not. Fear not. Because this little nugget, this little nugget that I stumbled upon is going to lead us into actually a deeper conversation. So, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and just let you listen to this. Oftentimes when I play these clips. I break in and give my commentary. But this one's just so, hmm, how should I put it? It's, well, why should I put it into words when I can just let you listen to it? And then we'll unpack it. So here goes. And before I let you listen to this, sorry, I know I promised I wasn't going to interrupt and I just interrupted my own self saying that I wasn't going to interrupt you. This comes from Gloria Copeland, the wife of Kenneth Copeland. You remember Kenneth? You remember Kenneth? We talked about him last week. The guy that just got his brand new spanking shiny jet? Yeah, that Kenneth. So, you know him. So the apple doesn't fall too far from the crazy husband tree? I'm not sure. But, uh, but yeah, so here, listen to Gloria. She's going to she's, she's gonna drop some, some good truth on you. It's going to be something you're going to savor. Hopefully, snarkily savor. But yes, now officially, here it goes. Well, listen, partners. We don't have a flu season. We've got a duck season, a deer season. But we don't have a flu season. And don't receive it when somebody threatens you with everybody's getting the flu. We've already had our shot. He bore our sicknesses and carried our diseases. That's what we stand on. And by his stripes, we were healed. If you've already got the flu, I'm going to pray for you right now. Father, I pray for every person that has symptoms of flu. I'm asking you, Lord, by your supernatural power to heal them now from the top of their head to the soles of their feet. Flu, I bind you off of the people in the name of Jesus. Jesus himself 
gave us the flu shot. He redeemed us from the curse of flu. And we receive it and we take it and we are healed by his stripes. Amen. You know, the Bible says he himself bore our sicknesses and carried our diseases. And by his stripes, we were healed. When we were healed, we are healed. So get on the word, stay on the word. And if, if you say, well, I don't have any symptoms of the flu. Well, great. That's the way it's supposed to be. Just keep saying that I'll never have the flu. I'll never have the flu. Put words, inoculate yourself with the word of God. So let's unpack all of that. Yeah. I think we need to kind of go through this. Because it's just so good. But the main thing that is just making me scratch my head. I mean, it's kind of mind-boggling that Jesus is the inoculation, the only inoculation that you need. That apparently if you're sick, it's because you don't have enough faith in that now again i'm i'm not going to be on here to discount people that pray i'm not even discounting prayer but i am a little bit like curious about this idea of somehow but what i am discounting is the fact that messages like this are being pushed to followers that you don't need a flu shot because Jesus already came for you. He died. He's your inoculation. Because, I'm sorry, how, how are you reading scripture, Gloria? I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure how we're getting to this level uh, of, of craziness. Because what begins to happen here and this is why conversations like this, this is why words like this, especially when you're speaking to people that are mentally vulnerable or mentally malleable, I'm not sure. I mean, whoever their followers are who wants to, I'm sorry, I'm kind of like at a loss for words for all of this too right now. There's like so many words in my head and I'm trying to be nice and explain this in just a, a very logical and clear manner. But when you have sheep that tend to follow shepherds like this one, messages like this are very dangerous. And they're dangerous on, on, on a couple levels. One, I know, I know that Gloria really doesn't care about the people that she's talking to. As long as they continue to like send in their donations, we're all like peachy keen here. Buy my book. Pay for my husband's private jet. I'm good. But think about this. So think about some people that really honestly think that they're following God, listening to these crackpots. What happens when your child gets sick and your only answer is prayer? Not use the insurance you have, not go to a clinic, not go to the doctor at all. Um, this can cause huge, huge problems. I mean, especially when, when you're having this ideal that you don't really need medicine, you just need Jesus. Now, I know in the Bible, Jesus heals. but I also know where we live today, most people, <laughs> not all people, <laughs> um, have access to health care in some way, shape, or manner. Maybe you have insurance, maybe you have a local clinic you can go to, but being able to tell people that that's not really necessary and all you really need is Jesus to pray this sickness away, that's that's. It, insidious and it's sick and and it's very dangerous i mean it's more dangerous than buying a lunatic his own private jet just because he needs it because what this begins to do because we talk about this we talk about like charlatans all the time 
on this show. And, and, and yes, I understand charlatans, they end up bilking people of money because the people are thinking they're doing God's will. And that's bad. So don't get me wrong here. That's bad. But this kind of takes a step further when we're actually really dealing with, with people's health and their livelihood and their lives. So when we begin to move down this road, it becomes very caustic and it becomes very sick on, on twofold. One, folks out there listening to this may not, listening to this, not me, listening to Gloria, uh, may not seek medical treatment and may just believe in the power of prayer which could lead to horrible complications. But then two, it gets even sicker because if you have the flu, if you are sick, it's because you haven't leaned on Jesus enough. And that right there, like psychologically speaking, is, is what these televangelists prey on. P-R-E-Y. Prey on. Because... It's this insecurity that somehow that you're not right with God. That because of X or Y or Z in your life, God is not happy with you. Because look, her husband, Kendrick Copeland, look at him. He's got jets. He's got money. He's got power. Because of course, in that rationale, God likes him. God is there blessing him. I mean, it's the same thing for like the Pat Robertsons. It's the same thing for the Joel Osteens. It's, it's, I mean, it's, it, this ends up being very systemic when you do this. And it can be very, very and deeply spiritually damaging and psychologically damaging when you kind of set up a paradigm like this. When bad stuff happens, well, God's testing you. Or if you're not wealthy or prosperous, it has nothing to do with evil economic systems in the government. No, 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 no. This really happens to do with your faith. And the only way that folks like this would tell you to really be in the center of God's will comes from giving them money or buying their book. But that's still giving them money. Because they sit in these cheesy studios I uh, have makeup and hair done, and they've got houses and cars and mansions, all this other kind of good stuff. So, of course, God must be blessing them, right? 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 <laughs> no. No. And that's how this con works. You speak to vulnerable people. You put crazy thoughts in their heads that pull on their own insecurities, their own idea of guilt, and, and this somehow belief that they are always, and I'll go ahead and say this, which is crazy. I know that, that Christians use this line of logic so much, but it ends up being this pagan belief that somehow the gods are angry with you. And if the gods are angry with you, you must do something to appease the gods. Now, if the gods are happy with you, maybe you are making a little more money, maybe your life seems stable and nobody's sick. Well, you have to keep giving because you don't want God to be pissed off at you. And it's this really bad theology of how to view God, that somehow God is, is always on the verge of just blowing it, like just, just, just having his rage overflow onto people. And, and it leaves people that believe things like this, always in a quandary, never knowing where they stand, never really knowing when they're going to screw up and what's going to happen. It's this kind of cause and effect God. You do this bad thing, I will do this to you. I mean, we've seen this. We've seen this from other televangelists that will say, oh, the hurricane in Haiti was because of their sin. Or the hurricane here is... And so they begin to, to develop this weird causality nature to how they view their faith. And the problem with it is there's other things at work in the world. Guess what? Sickness happens. And... It's not that God is inflicting you with cancer or whatever sickness that you have. No, no, no. Some of this is a biological human response to issues in your body. We have germs. We have things that cause cancer. We have, we have a lot of different things that have nothing to do with your faith. It could be your genetics. It could be any number of things. But when we begin to say this situation that you're in, you're in it, because God's not happy with you, or because you don't have enough faith. That gets very sick and damaging and twisted. And the reason they do it 
It's because these folks, these snake oil salesmen, stay in power and keep their influence as long as they keep these people that follow and listen to them at a disadvantage. So if people are always worried about where they stand with God, well, <laughs> they're going to keep coming back to listen to whatever crap that these people are spewing to them. So yes, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Copeland. That was wonderful. It was wonderful because that and that crooked, twisted thinking leads me to talk about our main topic of the day. And I want to be able to talk about really, and, and again, I don't know if we have enough time to cover all of this, but we're going to kind of scratch the surface on this. The, the weird relationship or war, depending upon where you stand on this, between faith and science. And, and it has always been this, this weird area where, especially if you're talking in conservative realms, uh, especially conservative Christian realms, this idea of science um, being evil and faith is good. Which again, if you want to go back to this, go deep into scripture. And again, I'm just going to like just run over some of these very, very, very quickly because we have a lot of other stuff to go to. But that ends up being, which is funny, if you were to tell like a conservative Christian, oh, you guys are kind of really being more like the Gnostics that were around during Jesus' time. See, the Gnostics believed that everything spiritual is pure and holy and everything of the flesh is dirty and sinful and evil. Now, if you dig into theology, most like early Christians and belief systems, especially from historical Christianity, would say that Gnostics are not congruent with Christianity, that Gnostics are pagan, they're, it's a bad belief system, blah, 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 all that kind of good stuff. But the funny thing is, these kind of Gnostic ideals have infiltrated a lot of conservative Christianity, especially when you start to get to these, and again, I'm not saying prosperity gospel folks are conservative Christians, they're, but I'm putting them in a whole like nutter butter category with, with these folks that emotionally manipulate and do horrible things to their followers. Those, those, those folks. And so when you begin to take this, you are able to see this, oh, faith, religion, it's an answer, it's pure, I can't see it. It's not always very tangible. And it's something that I can't put my fingers on, but oh, but only if you have enough faith, only if you have enough of this, then you can get to this level, then you can get to this place. But the things that are of this earth, which we will also get to later, it could be the environment. It could be science. It could be all of these other things. Oh, those are bad. Those are bad. Because they don't end up speaking of things in the realm of spirituality. Which, again, I know I've kind of laid this out in very binary terms. Uh, not my belief system, but really breaking theirs down into a very, uh, very black and white way that folks preach and folks really handle their own theology. Because again, when you're talking about stuff with faith and theology, the more black and white you can make it, the better, because that preaches better. I'm not saying it's right. I'm saying that's what they do. Because guess what? In the world, there's black, there's white, but there's all of this gray. There's all of this in-between stuff. There's all the stuff that has to do with context. So it's never as easy as a lot of religious people like to make it. Because guess what? It's not about either or. It's about and. Because I believe, ultimately, that there's nothing wrong with having faith, but also being able to trust in science. Because guess what? This is the weird thing that, I, that I, I've found in religious circles that people, especially more of the conservative ilk, just have a hard time wrapping their head around this. So if science is the pursuit of knowledge and really being able to understand how the world works, whether it's on a microscopic level, whether it's on a looking into space far off level, it's the pursuit of God's creation. So wouldn't folks in the scientific realm be pursuing truth just as much as you in the religious realm be pursuing truth as well. So you're both seeking truth. So if you're both on this journey to truth, what's the deal? What's the issue? Now, I bring up Gloria 
because I want to begin to, to delve a little bit into two topics that, that have really been making me scratch my head a lot lately, especially when it comes to Christianity. Um, the first one, and this isn't exclusive to Christianity, I'll just go ahead and lay that out, but there are some interesting trends that we're being able to see in this. So the first topic we will hop into is about the anti-vaccine movement and how, yes, it is picking up steam in, in conservative Christian circles. Before, they were just nutters on each side of the political spectrum. But oh no, with Trump in the office, the Oval Office, we're getting a lot more crazy into conservative Christianity. And then secondly, I want to talk about uh, the environment and climate change in the same realm of why does this have to be either faith or science in this? Why can't we do both? Because seriously, folks, religious folks I'm speaking to you right now, if you believe what the Bible says, that people are made in the image of God, both male and female, made in the image of God. Okay, so let's just run with that little thread of logic there. Okay, so let's look at humanity. Okay, so we are created, we are conscious beings, we have a brain, we have intelligence, we have logic, we have reason. And with those brains that we have, uh, we are able to figure out things about the known universe. We look into areas of, <laughs> of medicine or in technology or exploring the universe that's either here on Earth um, or out into the cosmos. That brain that we were given, if you're going to like hold to your holy scriptures of saying that God created us in his own image, means, means, means that our intelligence is not something that we should be afraid of. See, I think, I think Christians miss this so many times that I believe that Jesus came not to make us divine beings, because guess what, we're not, but to help us be fully human, to fully live into the, our humanity. When God created us, it says in Genesis, he created us and he said it was good. In fact, he says it was very good. So if you're going to hold to that, why is human intelligence and the pursuit of knowledge inherently bad? See, it doesn't add up. It doesn't add up at all. That kind of, that kind of like, yeah, that kind of thinking, it doesn't add up. And so speaking about things not adding up, let's hop into the anti-vaccine movement. That, that is kind of starting to take off with conservative Christians. And this is scary. So let's take a little stroll down memory lane here. Now, traditionally, when you begin to talk about anti-vacciners, you would have arguments. This is, this is going back, back a little ways. So you would typically, in Christian circles, no big deals. Not a really big deal. Like, you would see, like, what is it, like, the Christian science? Or what are they, like, yeah, the Church of Christian Science or the Christian Scientists, which... I don't even like saying that because they're not scientists. Where they would, yes, they would typically routinely turn down vaccinations and have been linked to measles outbreaks. Yay! Amongst members of their faith. Great! So, you had those, which again, fringe, fringe groups that I'm not even really sure you called Christian scientists Christians, even though it's in their name, but irregardless. So, so those, those folks, those folks, again, off on the side, not a big deal. People just go, cuckoo, and, that, and that's kind of fine. Like, okay, which a lot of anti-vacciners are, cuckoo. And then really just when you begin to look at this, there's like the Dutch Reformed Church, which is of like the Protestant ilk um, of Christianity. They've, you know, historically been ones that would turn down vaccinations uh, because they thought that vaccinations interfered with the person's relationship with the Lord? Oh, Lord. I don't even know how that makes sense, but I'm just giving you some facts. And we've also had, like, the Catholic Church uh, has had certain objections to vaccines um, because they were believing that they were uh, using some of the, some of the vaccines in the past, had used voluntarily aborted fetuses. And so, again, 
they would say, hey, we're we're a little bit iffy on this kind of stuff and for perfect uh, for certain vaccinations. Now um, you begin to see the rise, uh, especially when you talk about like the HPV vaccination, you are seeing Christians that conservative Christians that are saying you shouldn't get this because if you get vaccinated for HPV, that just leads your children to be more sexually promiscuous. Yeah. So they're worried about something that hasn't happened yet, and they're just assuming that if their children get this vaccination, that that means they're going to go and run and sleep with anything out there in town. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's not a small group. Like The Family Research Council has had issue with vaccines that target sexually transmitted diseases. Because, again, they worry that if you get this vaccine somehow, somehow, spiritually, not really, um, that as soon as that needle goes in your arm, you're going to put your needle somewhere else. That was a euphemism. Not even a really good one. But you're kind of catching this drift. So again, this kind of has to do with this weird fear. Like fear, oh no, if we take this, we're going to go and our kids are going to whore themselves out everywhere and sleep around and bang whatever they want to. Or you have then the other further out ones that are saying, this may harm our relationship with God. Now, I can understand all of this because most of this in the past has been from the fringes. But along came Trumpy. Along came Trump. So I want to hop in, I want to hop into an article uh, from the Washington Post by Elena Sun. And it's called Trump Energizes the Anti-Vaccine Movement in Texas. Now, this is back from earlier in this presidency, back in February of last year. And within this, we're going to see a common theme. And it's the same common theme that I brought up at the very beginning. We were talking about Gloria Copeland. It's this irrational fear. Okay? The church uses irrational fear. But guess what? So does Trump. And because they started noticing this uh, happening in Texas, um, where you began to see families stop immunizing their young children because they had doubts about vaccine safety. Like, I remember this when my kids were younger, where there was all this stuff on the internet about the MMR vaccine causing autism and blah, 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 blah. And, and when you're a parent, like, I, I can understand some of this. Like, you, you, have, you have this child that is, this child is in your care, and you love them, and you don't want anything bad to ever happen to them for their entire life. And, and especially, like, when a parent of a young child, like, especially it's like your first one, everything is, like, scary. Like, you're worried about anything. And with me, by the time you get to your fourth one, you're just like, ah, just go hang out in the yard all day. Uh, just put, you know, we'll just tie you up in the yard like a dog and you'll be fine. I'm kidding. But really at the beginning, because you don't have any experience as being a parent, everything is scary. And, and again, it's preying on this <laughs> irrational fear. Uh, like with my wife and I, we, we've been good parents. You can ask my kids because I told them if they answer this any other way, we're not feeding them for a week. I'm kidding. But I remember at the beginning, we, we were both two smart human beings who read all the books, who research and are very present in our kids' lives, but still you have this fear that something is going to happen to your kid. Like you're going to do something that's going to scar them for the rest of your life uh, or something may happen to them from an outside uh, source that is going to scar them for the rest of your life. Basically, as parents, we're just really trying to avoid scarring our children. And in the process, we probably end up scarring our children anyways. But what was happening in Texas was, was this debate and uh, around uh, can schools force children to be vaccinated? Now, um, all these anti-vaccine advocates found, especially with Trump in the White House, kind of found a new person, a new person to kind of stoke the fire. Because again, like when I'd mentioned this, like I remember all the stuff about the MMR vaccination, it was always just like weird internet conjecture. Or it was like somebody saying stuff in a forum. And, and this isn't really scientifically based, but maybe it sounds a little scientific. You know, that's how this kind of stuff works. But now 
when you have somebody in the Oval Office, arguably uh, the most powerful man in the free world. Sorry, it's hard to say that, but it is true. And when you have him beginning to push out, or not beginning, but continuing to push out crazy crackpot theories of linking vaccines to autism, it's going to change the way you think of this, right? Like, you can have a crazy neighbor that has all these weird thoughts, but when the president starts having all these kind of crazy thoughts and is talking about them openly, it, it gives a lot more legitimacy to these irrational fears that you already have. Now, we already know we already know that Trump is a crackpot. He loves embracing all sorts of conspiracy theories and pushing them out because he can say whatever he wants to. And up until now, and probably continuing into the future, he can say what he wants to, and there's no consequence to him at all, which is dangerous and scary and a whole nother show. But we're beginning to see as people are becoming more and more scared and not vaccinating their kids we're beginning to see outbreaks of stuff like measles and mumps. Stuff that, in my whole childhood, you never saw. Why? Because people did what they were supposed to do. You got vaccines. Why you get a vaccine? Because <laughs> you don't want to get a certain disease. That's why you do this. And, like, statistically, like, in this argument, uh, in, sorry, argument, in this article, um, I'll go ahead and quote this. says, Public health experts warn that this growing movement is threatening one of the most successful medical innovations in modern times. Globally, vaccines prevent deaths of about 2.5 million children every year. But deadly diseases such as measles and the whooping cough um, are still circulating in populations where not enough people get vaccinated. See, this is scary. Because we all know that Trump really just talks out his ass and never has anything to back what he's saying. But if he says it, it must be true. And again, you take Trump, who ends up being the orange messiah of the conservative white Christian, and you take all of this irrational fear, you bundle it together, they're going to start listening to their Cheeto in chief. That's what's going to happen. Like, it was believed that we'd pretty much eradicated measles like 15 years ago. It's highly contagious. But we've been seeing returns of the measles in areas where people are not vaccinating their kids. So I am making a tie between this, a tie between faith, religion, Trump craziness, and this anti-vaccine movement that is a complete fraud. It is a fraud. And so what I want to do, I'm going to pull this up here. Um, this is uh, from the Pew Research Center. Um, and and it, from around that time, back in uh, February. And what they found was this. And it says this. It says, most Americans say vaccines should be required for school children. And a larger share of conservatives say that parents should be able to decide. So they were breaking down this uh, based upon like political affiliation and religious affiliation, all this kind of stuff. And so here's really the numbers that they found. So um, when it comes to ideology, so 25% of the conservatives that they interviewed said parents should be able to decide not to vaccinate their children. Now compare that to moderates that were at 15% and liberals that were at 9 And you begin to see this, now you go down to religious affiliation. So 22% of white evangelical Protestants 22% believes that the parent should be able to say, nah, I don't want to vaccinate my kid. 22% of white evangelical Protestants think it's okay to not vaccinate your kid. Politically speaking, 25% of the conservatives they talked about, they talked to, said that you shouldn't have to vaccinate your kid. Now, my big issue with this is, fine, homeschool your kids and live in whatever kind of viral petri dish that you want to have. See, the problem comes into this, it's when your kid is around other people's kids. That's when outbreaks start happening. And that becomes a bigger problem. That becomes a huge problem. As we've seen outbreaks in areas like Texas that I mentioned earlier and some spots in California as well too, you begin to see this when kids are not simply vaccinated 
for these diseases that we had hopefully, for the most part, eradicated, those diseases come back. Shocker. It's a very simple line of logic. You don't get vaccinated, you have a higher chance of getting this disease. But you also have a higher chance of giving other people that disease. And that is a scary thought. And just because Trump has his questions about vaccinations, that stands to legitimize this crackpot view of science. And it's downright scary. It's downright scary how much uh, how much the conservative base has become a group of people that don't think and just follow their savior. Donald, the Donaldist Trump. And I'm fine if adults want to make dumb decisions, but the problem is those dumb decisions are affecting their kids who haven't had a chance to really be able to decide, <laughs> do I want this? Do I not want this? Where do I stand? No, it's affecting children. And furthermore, it's affecting other people's children. And that is scary. And none of that has to do with faith. And I don't even know why, in the midst of all of this, faith is getting caught up in there. But it is and we've seen this. We've seen somehow where faith circles, especially conservative Christian faith circles, have become a vacuum for free thought. They've become a place where things like science and logic and reason do not have a place to grow. They're not even conversation pieces. It's simply do what I say or you're out of the tribe. And none of this has to do with Jesus. None of this has, well, none of this should have to do with Christianity. It just happens that Christians are caught up in all of this. Don't believe me? Well, let me go ahead and read this. This comes from an article uh, from The Conversation, and it's called Anti-Vaccination Beliefs Don't uh, Follow the Usual Political Polarization. Okay, So, um, and this is interesting. I'm just going to go ahead and directly quote this. And since some of this is a little bit old, but since President Obama was elected in 20, uh, 2008, those on the right have had a much more negative opinion about the federal government. And in uh, 2014, Pew uh, survey shows that those who were dissatisfied with the direction of the country um, in 2014 were 10% more likely to believe that vaccinations should be a parent's choice um, than those who were satisfied um, who were the most dissatisfied with the direction of the country in 2014? The very conservative and the conservative. So again, far conservative and moderately conservative. So I'm going to go back to quoting now. Essentially, it doesn't matter if you're conservative or liberal. The more political someone is, the more likely he or she is to think that vaccines are unsafe. Yet, um, it is only the very conservative um, that are more likely to believe that vaccinations should be the parent's choice. And again, you can make links between <laughs> conservatism and political affiliation. Which is sad that all of this is happening. But um, other than getting information out there and being able to engage with people that you meet in healthy uh, communal ways, there's really no way to be able to change this, especially when we have Trump continuing to tweet out crazy conspiracy theories about whatever is on the top of his head when he's sitting on the can on a daily basis. And that brings me to also talk about conservative Christians and their issues with science in regards to the environment, more specifically to climate change. And we can't fully talk about climate change without talking about Trump. And let's see, I've got an article here from the Washington Post called, <laughs> aptly put, why don't conservative Christians worry about climate change? Question mark, answer, God. And this is by Lisa Vox. And in this article, they begin to do this. And it's something I've been saying forever too, that, and this will be my opinion, and then I'll get to hers as well too, within this. Mm, 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 mm. 
I didn't think it could get worse until last year when President Trump decided to withdraw out of the Paris Climate Agreement, where conservatives applauded him for doing that. And it began to make me scratch my head. Because, again, not that the Paris Climate Agreement was that binding of an agreement to begin with. It was more of just a show that we were, trying, we were behind changing climate. I'm sorry, we're behind really being pro-Earth and this climate change thing is human-related. It's us! We did it! And I believe that there is a direct link. There's a direct link between, and I'll tell you this, how you read the Bible and if you believe that climate change is real and a problem that is caused by humans. You see, most evangelicals conservatives, Protestant Christians, have this belief in end times. And if you haven't, you, there's great films out there with Kirk Cameron that'll inform you and in all you need to know about the fiction of how people think the end times will happen. Also, there's an update with Nicolas Cage. So that, I don't know if that ups the ante or makes it worse. I, I'm not really even sure cinematically. They're both pieces of crap. But this idea that there is going to be an end of the world, that God, Jesus, will come back, rescue the good believers, and leave all of those sinful humans to burn in judgment. Blah, 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 blah. I'm sorry. That's, a that's, like, that's my like 10-second summary of, of really bad end times theology. But essentially this idea that everything is going to end. We're sitting around waiting as dutiful Christians. We're sitting around waiting for Jesus to finally come back uh, so that we can get off of this S-hole planet that we live on right now. Oh my gosh, Jesus, save me. But if think about this. Let's just let's untangle that idea. So if, if you believe that God will destroy the earth, God's going to destroy the creation that he created for whatever reason that conservatives believe this. So that God is really just going to ultimately trash this place. Well, it's kind of like, have you ever been in a rental car and you're kind of like, man, I don't really care. It's a rental. I'm going to turn it back in. I don't care how hard I drive this or whatever I drive over or whatever else. It's a rental. We're treating the earth like a rental car. And that that is really just the conservative Christian perspective on this. That somehow... God loves them. The rest of creation can all go to hell. And in the meantime, it really doesn't matter how we treat the earth because eventually we're going to be gone. Now, the one part of this is right. And this is, this is, this is the part that I think is, actually makes it a little bit worse, um, especially of the older generation of, of, like, of conservatives and evangelicals. They're in the twilight of their life. The end is near for them, not because of Jesus, just because of time. They're old, they will die. That's the easy math of the situation that I'm laying out here. And they don't really care what kind of world they're leaving for the kids. They don't care what they're leaving for, for future generations. Which, again, selfish, sick, unchristian to begin with. Um, I don't think that Jesus is really big on just saying, ah, what the F, it doesn't really matter. I'm going to come back one day so you guys can treat this thing. Don't even worry about your security deposit. It doesn't matter. God will rescue you. Again, it's going back to that early thinking from dear Gloria Copeland that we talked about earlier in the show. But why would you care about the earth? Why would you care about the environment? Even though it's in the book of Genesis. Ken Ham's favorite book. It's in there that we're called to take care of creation because it's God's creation and we're supposed to love it, care for it, tend to it, defend it. No, 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 no. When you get to the book of Revelations, it depends on how you read it because most of those people on the far right will read it absolutely literally in places and not literally in other places, which is really bad scholarship, but that's a whole other story. But the idea that if we're all going to get out of here, and that, remember, I mentioned Gnostic teachings earlier, this idea that everything's spiritual and the spiritual realm is pure and everything earthly is garbage, even though it's God's creation, people. Huh, huh, huh. Your logic doesn't hold up. But with all of this, that if you have a get-out-of-earth-free card, which they would call the rapture, 
Why would we care about the environment? God's going to take care of it. God's going to handle it. And if you don't believe me, I'm going to hop back to the Washington Post article. And they have a quote in here from uh, Tim Wahlberg. Hopefully not related to dear Mark Wahlberg. But, uh, but yeah, this is what he said. Uh, he's representative from Michigan. He's a Republican. Shocker. As a Christian, I believe that there is the creator God who is much bigger than us. And I'm confident that if there's a real problem, he'll take care of it. That's kind of like the ostrich syndrome answer. Like, I'm just going to put my fingers in my ears and say, la, 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 and let the whole world burn down. Which one thing that I would believe runs through scripture is this idea of personal responsibility and personal accountability. And when I hear conservatives make claims like this, they're not taking any personal responsibility in the problem. And much like Trump, um, who doesn't like to listen to all of the intelligence community that said Russia meddled with our election, he also has a similar relationship with environmental scientists or people that think and don't agree with him. He has a problem with those folks. Because they continue to say this over and over again. It was like two years ago, we had Catherine Hayhoe, who's fantastic. You can search for it on our website, www.snarkyfeet.com. We did like two, it was like a two-part interview with her, um, who's a climate scientist and is a leading voice, who also is a Christian. Her husband is a pastor. And somehow, she can make both of those things work. Because... It shouldn't be mutually exclusive. But when we begin to move towards this, climate change, okay? We're having stronger storms, colder winters, hotter summers. Last summer, hottest summer on record. And for us to keep saying, meh, 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 we didn't do this, God's in charge. These are the people that would also stick to like the new earth theory that, oh, oh, the Bible would tell us here it's only like, what is it, like 3,000 years old? Just trust us. Just trust us. The Bible does not say the age of the earth. So don't go trying to make it say things that it doesn't say. But this is where it gets scary. So back to the article. Amongst conservative evangelicals, um, nearly all evangelicals, 88%, according to the Pew Research Center, uh, believe in miracles suggesting a faith in a proactive God. And only 28% of evangelicals believe human activity is causing climate change. Let me say that again. Only 28% of evangelicals believe that human activity is causing climate change, even though we have things like science and data and reports. But again, remember... If you're an evangelical, if you're an evangelical, science is not your friend. But seriously, the article continues to say, confidence that God will intervene to prevent people from destroying the world is one of the strongest barriers to gaining the conservative evangelical support for environmental pacts like the Paris Agreement. So we begin to see this. We begin to see this shocking, scary trend. That we are causing this problem. We are causing this. But Christians are by and large silent, ignoring, putting their fingers in their ears and saying, la, 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 doesn't exist, doesn't apply to me. And it's shameful. It's disgusting, actually. Because it's not congruent with what you read in Scripture that we are called to care for the earth. We're called to care for for God's creation. So how is this lining up logically? Well, when we talk about evangelicals, we can't talk about things like this and not mention the fact that they're kind of drunk on their own comfort, meaning that they like the world in a certain way. And especially if you listen to Trump's MAGA idea. We want to roll back the clock, back to the day and age where we didn't have seatbelts, those good times, where you could just throw anything out your car window. Wasn't even really litter. 
It was just a way of life. That's what it meant to be American. You could just open up a cold brew as you drove down the highway without a seatbelt, with your kids rolling around in the back seat. Those are the good days of America. And if you can't tell from listening to a show called Snarky Faith, I'm being horribly sarcastic right now. I just say that because some evangelicals have a hard time hearing sarcasm. It's like they can't hear it at all. So to summarize what we've gone through so far in the show, science is bad if you're an evangelical Christian. It's worse if you're conservative evangelical Christian. And because of that, God's in charge because we've learned that you don't need vaccines because Jesus is the only vaccine you'll need. And global warming, climate change, all of these things that are happening, don't worry about it. God is in charge. Because we're deferring to God to do things that we should do on our own. I don't want to get up for work tomorrow. See, I'll use this logic. I don't want to get up for work tomorrow. God will go to work for me. I don't want to pay my bills. God will pay my bills for me. That doesn't make any sense. That's just plain stupid and idiotic. If there are things that we can do to be able to care for the earth, to be able to care for our children, we should do them. If we have the tools in front of us, don't put this on God. This is on you, Christians. This is on you. If all of the tools are in front of you to fix these problems that I've been talking about today, don't put this on God. Because if your kid catches a disease, it's not his fault. It was yours for being a bad parent. If the globe, (laughs) if our earth continues to deteriorate at the pace that we are on, This is not because of God's will. This is because of humanity not giving a crap and being horribly, horribly selfish. Now, this would be a horrible place for me to end the show. So I'm going to give a couple of quick ideas on how we can merge these things. So that's what you got. You got 50 minutes of doom and gloom, and then I'm going to just squeeze in a little bit of hope here at the end. This comes from an article called, called Can Science Find a Common Ground with Evangelicals? Uh, from Sci- uh, scientificamerican.com. Uh, and guess who pops up in that? Yeah, our buddy, our buddy, Catherine Hayhoe. And, and their answer is to also use the Bible as a tool to be able to connect these issues and find solutions to this problem. So uh, uh, Heho said this. She said, it's beautiful when you can use scripture to counteract what sounds like scriptural arguments. Um, And they add in here, and so she's here in this situation. She is talking with Mitch Hescott. And so Mitch Hescott says, God created a sustainable world, but he also told us to take care of it. And Hescox goes on to say this, and I love it. Human beings are accountable for how they care for, about God's creation. Uh, to not tend to creation, to not steward it as a shepherd, um, as a renter, as a leaser of the land, is definitely unbiblical, untheological. And as we've talked about this, that evangelical Christians tend to be conservative, tend to not give up two craps about this. And they continue to want some sort of a a miracle, a Hail Mary to fix this. But that's not how we're going to fix this. And both Hayho and Hescox, they are are leaning on this. And I love it. I love it. They said that's why um, we should focus on biblical verses that dwell on uh, conservation and stewardship or the effect of climate change can have on poor countries, uh, poor communities around the world. Hey, anyone else know uh, some conservative Christians that have organizations that are supposed to help poor countries around the world? <laughs> Franklin Graham. Oh, sorry. Um, and so what they are saying here, what they are getting at here, that this idea between religion and science is not a conflict, that there is a way for us to be collaborative about how we're doing this. That, that there is a beauty to both. And Aho continues to say this. 
she's uh oh, when talking about climate change she says this she says evangelicals are extremely decentralized and fragmented she said who do evangelicals listen to as thought leaders the conservative media and climate change is now the most polarized issue in the united states so if we listen to the conservative news we hear people tell us it's not true and they share other values so why shouldn't we trust this one and i think the key to this is to return to scripture to return to what this is all about simply put use the bible to defend scientists and earth care that's all I've got this hour. Thanks so much for being part of this journey. Just a reminder, if you want to catch this show or past shows, you can catch us on www.snarkyfaith.com. And I will be back with you guys again next week. I send you out with grace and peace because there is hope to this insanity. And that hope is you, my dear listeners. Go out and change the world. Make it a better place. Be the change you want to see. WCOM is listener-supported community radio, and Snarky Faith is only possible through our sponsors. Lumen, a spiritual community of seekers, sojourners, question askers, doubters, and skeptics, is a collective of fellow travelers that embrace the truth that all of life is sacred, hope is real, and tomorrow can be a better day than today. All are welcome. You can find more information at www.lumencommunities.com.